well, would you please join me in prayer and we will go to the throne of grace asking for God to teach us more of his grace in the life of our beloved Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for the gift of song that you've given your church that we can express healthy doctrine in such a beautiful fashion. Everything beautiful in this life from flowers to music, colors, the beauty of the distinction between ethnic diversities, all of it is your beautiful power on display. We give you praise. Give you praise for your word that teaches us who you are and what you expect of us and that shows us how one can be rightly related to God the Father through God the Son, through the ministry of the Spirit. Would you be so kind today to open blind eyes and hearts of those who have not come all the way to Christ, that they would see Christ as precious and all-glorious, and that they would flee their sins in biblical repentance and place their faith in Christ alone. And for those that are in Christ today, that as we go through this study, grow us in our love for Jesus, our hatred for sin, and help us to walk in righteousness for your praise and glory. Might that be what motivates us. For your glory we ask. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, and join me in Mark chapter 14. I'd like to preach to a sermon that we've entitled, Betrayed with a Kiss. From Mark 14, we'll read verses 43 to 52 in just a moment. We want to set our hearts and minds to the topic at hand. Have you ever heard of a Judas goat? A Judas goat is a trained goat used in general animal herding. The process works as follows. In the case of sheep, the goat is trained to associate and become familiar with the sheep in the field. Eat with them, lie down with them, and generally gain their trust. After many months, the season arrives for leading the sheep into the slaughterhouse. As the stockyards open, the sheep, in an innocent manner, will follow the Judas goat into specially marked pens or into the back of trucks and, in some instances, into the slaughterhouse itself. The outcome for the goat differs from the sheep because as the goat leads an entire flock into the slaughter, a special gate is prepared and opened for only the goat enabling the goat to escape the final gate that leads the others to their deaths. The goat will escape the slaughter, returning to the field, where he'll begin that deceptive process all over again with a new flock of sheep. Judas goats are also used to lead other animals to specific pens and onto trucks. They've fallen out of use in recent times, but can still be found in various smaller slaughterhouses in some parts of the world, as well as conservation projects. Cattle herders may use a Judas steer to serve the same purpose as a Judas goat does. The technique and the term originated from cattle drives in the United States in the 1800s. But that term, Judas goat, you mentioned the name Judas, and even people from outside the church, unbelievers understand what that name stands for. It stands for deception. It stands for betrayal of the worst kind from a supposed friend. We come to yet an, another integral part of the Passion narrative. It's related by all four gospel accounts. This is the final prophesied betrayal and arrest of Jesus. This would be part three of the whole Gethsemane account. If you were to try to think in brief terms about Gethsemane, you could hang it all on three words. Revelation, agony, and betrayal. The Gethsemane account begins when Jesus leads his disciples from the Last Supper in the upper room, and they're going over to Gethsemane. 
And on that way to Gethsemane, he reveals the way, on the way, the, the, that they were all going to fall away. It's not going to be a rank betrayal like Judas would do, but every disciple is going to flee Jesus. And they respond with prideful overconfidence. Not us. Even Peter as the spokesperson, though everyone fall away, I'll be right by your side, I'll die for you. When they get to Gethsemane, there's agony in prayer. Jesus has three prayer vigils. And yet the disciples failed to watch and pray to not enter temptation. So since they didn't watch and didn't pray, what did they do? They entered into temptation. Which leads us to the betrayal and arrest with everyone fleeing. In contrast to the emotion and the anguish of Gethsemane's prayer stands Gethsemane's arrest and this brawny, hell-bent animosity of a mob. There's a term that goes throughout this section, cretane, which means is translated in our English Bibles as seas, repeatedly punctuates the paragraph. Verse 44, 46, 49, 51. This is all about betrayal and seizing and arrest of Jesus. And while the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, provides important supplemental material, Mark's quite clear on his own behalf. He's concise. And he centers the attention on one man, Judas, which in, is Mark's last mention of this treacherous one. Jesus is shadowed and apprehended by a relentless bureaucracy in which they, as now, persons and processes are set in motion for which no one seems responsible. I didn't do it. No one's able to stop. With the crowd, the henchmen, they're all faceless and unnamed. Even the identities of those who most pique our curiosity, the sword-wielding sympathizer, you've got to turn elsewhere to another gospel account to find out that the person that chopped off the servant's ear is Peter. He's unnamed in Mark's account, intentionally. Or how about the streaker that ends, this, ends the paragraph? All of them remain anonymous. The only person's named are Judas and Jesus. And this is their fateful and final meeting. Would you follow along in your copy of God's Word, Mark chapter 14, I'll begin reading for us in verse 43. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now he who was betraying him had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away under guard. After coming, Jesus immediately went to him, saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. They laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. And they all left him and fled. A young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him. But he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. So we've got several players in this betrayal and arrest. You know, if you... Notice the back of your bulletin. We're going to see a a hostile crowd. We're going to contemplate the deceitful traitor, the impulsive disciple, the incomparable Christ, ending with the cowardly apostles. Let us begin with this hostile crowd in verse 43. We're greeted with Mark's favorite word at the very beginning, immediately, euthos. In what has been a condensed and fast-paced portrait of the life of Christ. that We've referred to, to Mark as the Reader's Digest Gospel. It's the smallest, shortest account of the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Who is indeed the Christ, the long hoped for Messiah. The only slowdown in Mark's whole book 
is when you come to Passion Week. As soon as they come up to Jerusalem, it slows way down, and he spends a, several chapters unpacking each hour and day of Passion Week. He uses that term here only to show there's been no interval between Gethsemane and it goes right into this betrayal and arrest. No interval between his words to the disciples and his actions. So right after his prayer time, his third time, verse 41, he, he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hours come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. I may have mentioned last week, I just wonder if, as he says that, if he sees Judas coming out from around a tree as it's right in process. He says, get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. And before passing over Judas's apparently redundant identification, where Mark, John Mark tells us Judas is one of the twelve. We know this. So why is he got to duplicate this? This is Mark's detail that the other gospel writers include, but it serves to kind of highlight and deepen the sense of horror. That this is not a stranger. This is not just a fair weather friend. This is from the inner circle of friends, the, the twelve. It's so that we would stand aghast at the agent of betrayal of God's anointed son who would actually come from the inner circle of the twelve, a trusted follower. And while he bears all of his culpability for transgression for the ultimate betrayal, the absolutely sovereign God is still working all things according to the counsel of his will. And this heinous disloyalty comes in exact fulfillment of Jesus' own announcement. He'd already said back in verses 18 to 20, as they were reclining at the table, that one is going to betray me, one who is dipping in the bowl with me. So there was three or four options at his end of the table. And Judas was right next to him. And to add insult to injury, so to speak, the betrayer is accompanied by a crowd, a crowd with swords and clubs who were coming from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. They're sent from the Sanhedrin. All three classes make up the Sanhedrin, the highest religious ruling body of Israel. So you've got teachers, quote-unquote, of the law, coming to lock up the great teacher, this rabbi from Nazareth. But they had to silence him. Nothing short of death would suit them. Now Luke 22.52 tells us that the chief priest came with officers of the temple. These are the police, in other words, and the elders that all come out against him in this mixed multitude. You know, they've got clubs, they've got swords. And swords is Mark's only clue to some of the agents of force and intimidation. We need to understand that the swords are the regular hand weapons of Roman soldiers. Even though Mark doesn't mention that there were hundreds of soldiers there, they were. The clubs would be the regular weapons of the temple police and the swords the weapons of the Roman soldiers. If you looked at John 18.12, John explicitly asserts the Roman soldiers under a commanding officer was present there. Now let me just be real transparent and honest. As a teacher of the Word, one who's spent a lot of time in the text, and I was amazed and uh, afresh. I didn't realize how huge a throng this was that showed up on the grandest scale. Very intimidating, overreaching, and overkill, which he'll address in just a moment. But when John tells us that there's a commander, that's the, the Roman military terminology. A cohort 
was given to Judas according to John 18.3, which is a tenth of a Roman legion. How many are we talking about? 600. 600 soldiers. And though the Romans were known for using a large number to move one prisoner, it's doubtful that the whole cohort was used. But since Mark tells us about the horde, Matthew tells us it's a great multitude, the number's pretty large. We don't know how many hundreds are surrounding Jesus at this moment. Hundreds of Roman soldiers, because the Sanhedrin can't put somebody to death. And so they brought those that are empowered to do that. That's all they've been driving at since chapter 3 and verse 6. Jesus didn't play by their rules. He had the audacity to heal people on the Sabbath and break Sabbath law. And so for all these chapters, they've been waiting for this opportunity. The Jewish temple police each of the three classes of the Sanhedrin, this is no minor deal. This is a national event. And though the Romans are guilty for their part in crucifying our Savior, all of it was driven by apostate religionists. And we must take note of that. You know, when you confront false religion, the false religionists come out of the corner fighting in anger and their fangs come out when you expose, kind of like uh, you know, if you've lived with his roaches, you turn on the lights and they just scurry. You know, the Sanhedrin can't put somebody to death. But that's what they've been driving at. I posted on social media this week uh, a saying, truth doesn't mind being questioned. You know, truth is an open book. Doesn't have anything to hide. But a lie does not like being challenged. You challenge a lie with the truth. Those who suppress the truth of God and unrighteousness and unrighteous behavior will be the result. Look for sinful anger with trumped up charges. They'd already trumped up. Jesus is a blasphemer. So they say. He's offering messianic teachings. He is putting himself in the place of God. We must silence him. But let's move on to the deceitful traitor in verses 44 to 46. Verse 44 begins, He who was betraying. Paradidos. The basic meaning is to hand over, to deliver, to betray. It's all throughout the Gospel of Mark. And chapter 14 has it in verse 10, verse 11, verse 18, 21, 41, 42, 44. This term of betraying, used a hundred times in the New Testament, Mark's got a fifth of them in his own gospel. And dear friends in the gospel, we must factor in a theology of betrayal to life this side of heaven. Don't set yourself up for fall out of ignorance. No, it's not a visible excuse to withdraw from relationships. Just realize, in a fallen world, people are going to do you dirty. They did our Savior dirty, and everyone that follows Him, they're going to do even worse. They can't get to Him, so they take it on His church. And so this one who is betraying, handing over, delivering to the Romans, to the apostate religionists, gave them a sign which occurs first in the sentence for emphasis. You know, in advance, a signal. And that signal would be a kiss. Phileo. You don't start studying the Bible very long before you learn terms of love in Scripture. And phileo is one of those. It has a more general meaning of love and affection. Frequently with a focus on close associations. When you consider somebody a friend, you love them. You phileo them. With this construction in the underlying Greek language, it specifically means to kiss. As in a greeting or farewell. You know, consider many of the New Testament holy kiss passages. 
when we had written an article and shepherded God's people through and after the COVID crackdown. What's one of our uh, biblical rationales as to why we're, we, uh, we're so against the masking? You can't recognize people. Uh, we, we communicate mostly not with our words, but our tonality and our bodily expressions. And we lost that in this faceless society. Well, this term uh, is changed in the next verse, verse 45. It's intensified. It's an intense love. So a kiss on the hand, a kiss on the cheek was common greeting given a rabbi by his young pupil. And since kisses of homage and respect were practiced in Israel, that's what he chose. It wouldn't be off base. Now we understand this is something very culturally different. We shake hands, but you lean in to give somebody a peck on the cheek and, cheek and it's like, keep your distance. You're in my, you're in my space. So slip on your first century sandals to understand this. This was a conveyance of respect and affection. And since it was, none of the disciples would have suspected anything, nor even much of the crowd who might be oblivious to what all's going on. They just got on in, in the excitement. And as this, this throng was marching towards Gethsemane, it got bigger and bigger. What's with all the excitement? So Judas had arranged the deal in advance. But with this intensification of the verb in verse 45, when he kissed him, he kissed him eagerly, affectionately, or repeatedly. He doesn't want the soldiers to miss that the moment he kisses, grab him and go. He didn't know what the response was going to be. This is definitely a show of affection that he abused. It was in reality a kiss of deceit, a kiss of betrayal. The customary greeting of respect turned into a sign of infamy and death. You know, if you mention, you know, we've, we've mentioned the, the Judas goat. How about the Judas kiss that lives on in infamy? An act of love performed on a mission of hate. His man's wicked heart that's so blind to its own evil wants to cover it up. It wants to beautify dung. And it continues today in the name of religion. You're doing this for, for God, really. You're doing it for God or you're doing it for yourself. You know, this act was similar to Joab's kiss and dagger ruse of Amasa back in 2 Samuel chapter 20, verses 9 and 10. You know, Joab comes. He gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites and they hanged them in the mountain before the Lord so that the... Uh, good verse, wrong chapter. Second uh, Samuel 20, verses 9 and 10. Right? I'm having a hard time seeing my notes. Joab said to Amasa, is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa was not on guard against the sword which was in Joab's hand, so he struck him in the belly with it and pour, poured out his inward parts on the ground and did not strike him again, and he died. And then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of victory. Same thing going on. The human heart doesn't change. It behaves the same way throughout the centuries. And so Judas immediately goes to Jesus in verse 45, addressed him as teacher, rabbi, and kissed him. And then they laid hands on him and seized him, verse 46. The kiss triggered the sting. They seized him. I had already mentioned in the introduction to the sermon, this, this term of seizing one, restraining, arresting, and controlling them punctuates throughout this paragraph. Like a common criminal, 
as in his humanity, Jesus has emptied himself. We looked at this Wednesday night as we looked at the humanity of Christ. Jesus emptied himself of the independent exercise of his attributes. He could have called it legions of ang angels to come to his rescue, and he chose not to. As he's treated in the most unjust way, as the mock trial will continue to bear out. This action is immediate. And who knows if Judas feared immediate, powerful repercussions. He'd already witnessed dramatic exorcisms with Jesus banish demons out of people and, and pigs running off cliffs to their own death. He'd witnessed walking on water and raising the dead and righteous anger cleansing the temple, powerful teaching coming from the lips of Jesus. He didn't know if Jesus would come back on him. So Judas tries to hide this vile deed with this sign of affection, this kiss. Now, no matter how one tries to pretty this up, to sweeten up religious justification or supposed lovely platitudes that this is for your best or this is for the best of the church, this was a direct attack on Jesus. There's no way to pretty that up. He is the son of the living God. Indeed, this was a kiss of the enemy of the cross who conspired for his own wicked advantage. Might wisdom's words constantly ring in our ears, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Proverbs 27, 6. Thirdly, is the impulsive disciple, a, a third player in this treachery. The impulsive disciples in verse 47. But, you know, in contrast to all those wicked other people, right? One of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. A vague expression of one who stood by. Matthew tells us that this is particularly one of the twelve, but you've got to have John's words to tell us he names him as Simon Peter. That's who the nameless face is. He drew his sword, struck the slave, cut off his ear. He couldn't stand idly by while his beloved master was taken into custody. You see how quickly that they had had to shake off their slumber. They'd been a snooze three times in, the, in Gethsemane. And they're immediately absorbed in this quickening drama. And as usual, his impulsive love is misdirected. And in this case, it was foolish. He was acting just like the Roman soldiers, just like the hateful false religionists. The victim wasn't a Roman soldier, nor temple police, but a trusted personal slave of the high priest, part of the mixed horde. That didn't do anything. John tells us that his name was Malchus. Malchus got the abuse from Simon Peter. You know, probably Peter just had a bad aim. He's probably trying to sever the guy's head so that maybe, maybe Malchus could, should have been glad it was just his ear that Jesus fixed up in, in no time. Not just a... Good shot. This is more of Peter's rashness, kind of like us going off half-cocked. But he wanted to make good on his overconfident earlier claim to stick it out. When others fall away, Lord, I'll be right there. Sword pulled from its shaft. When comparing the Gospels, and you see what one author leaves out, Matthew tells us that Jesus at this moment rebukes Peter. And then he gives an explanation of why he needed to be arrested. We sang a song before the sermon this morning, the new Getty hymn by faith. That is what God has called his children to, a walk of faith, not of sight. We just search the scriptures, we see his promises, we see his principles, and we move based on what he has said, not what we can rationalize and figure out and see in our own experience. 
Because the Bible many times works countercultural, counterintuitive to the way we think things ought to go. They're arresting my Lord, Simon Peter says, I'm going to pull out my sword. No. Peter is working by sight, not by faith. He's using an implement like a sword, like the Gentiles use. But Messiah's kingdom is not of this world. Just, just put a quick handle of application on in our own lives and contemporary ministry. We don't do gospel ministry the way corporate America does, where you do surveys to try to make unbelievers feel comfortable in the oddness of what we go through in our worship. When you're, you're drinking wine and, and eating a matzah cracker that pictures the body and blood of our Lord. That's odd. You know, the world looks on where somebody strikes you on a cheek and you give them the other one. That doesn't make human sense. But the gospel sure doesn't make sense of it all. We handle business in the church in such an otherworldly way. It's not a pound of flesh. It's not returning kind for kind. It's not a matter of personality styles and people being a good fit. Nobody's a good fit for the church. It's a matter of faithfulness. The Bible dices things very clearly of sin and righteousness issues. The Scriptures make everything clear. Doing biblical ministry, God's work, God's way, will not lack God's blessing. Peter needed to learn that. So coming off this dope's antics, like we we often see ourselves in the faces of of these disciples, we must move to the most glorious player in the drama. Verses 48 and 49 highlight our incomparable Christ. Notice what Jesus said. Verse 48 says, and Jesus said to them, now stop just a moment. This is not what Jesus did. Peter did, and it was a wrong did. What Jesus said. Now, this is following on the heels of Jesus' three prayer vigils, his heart in dependent and constant communion with the Father's will. He's at peace. The only person out of the hundreds of people there that night is this one, the incomparable Christ. In fact, he's unruffled, he's collected, he's calm. While quietly submitted to the Father's will, he protested the disqualifying sinful manner of the religious leaders, the the leaders that were so unlike God. They are teachers of the law. No, this is the good teacher whose actions are totally opposite. And notice what he did say. Have you come out against a robber? Is this not prophetic of how he's going to be hung up in just a few hours? Jesus is hung up. He's crucified with criminals. They treated our glorious, incomparable Christ as a common criminal. Now, Galilee was a famous haven for bandits. Josephus, the Jewish historian, notes their habitual malpractices, theft, robbery, and violence. But there's a clear contrast between Jesus and the assassins and revolutionaries. These these people that just seized him are over-the-top aggressive in contrast with his patience and gentleness, the good shepherd. They're acting like he's a formidable public enemy who needs to be subdued with armed force. And all of this is being done in the name of God. Though it was so offensive, it's dishonoring to God. It was only glorifying to self, the religious leaders who wanted to keep their peace of religion. Now this this verse can be taken as either a question or a statement. And the New American Standard that I preach out of is a question mark. I lean more towards the statement. Exclamation point. Add in a little righteous indignation of this one. Either way, it's a protest against the blindness and the stupidity that has deemed such force as necessary, to say nothing of the indignity of it all. He's not a bandit. 
they had, have had ample opportunity to observe his character. What's the general tenor of Jesus' life? You see two cleansings of the temple at the beginning of his ministry and at the end. That's the only real excitement of righteous indignation that they'd observed. And it wasn't filled with all the sinful emotion that our anger is filled with. They refuse to observe. They have refused to accept the truth. You know, I'm reminded of a pastor of our day who was being maligned as some had besmirched his name and just trying to find things to dig up on him. Yet some godly saints spoke the truth in love, admonishing, well, why don't you just go talk to him? The reply was, oh, he won't listen. And yet they continued in gentleness with, sorry you think that. As I went, he patiently talked for hours, handling each question, serving and shepherding us. Beloved, recognize the adversary is in the shadows here of our text. Very successful in dividing one, and yet the spirit unified another. Satan loves disunity, divisions, factions, Dissensions, uproars, falsehoods, distortions, lies, compromise, cowardice, distinction, slander, and counterfeits. He hates the body of Christ. Religious hypocrisy is repulsed by righteousness. Jesus came into this world born of the Virgin Mary, and just by him living life, even without his teaching, condemned them. He says, every day I was in the temple with you teaching. His ministry was all above board. It's open. It's sincere. Even the questions that came his way, he'd answer. No hidden agenda. Just doing the work that the Father gave him to do. Over in John 18, verses 20 and 21. Here was a question. Jesus answered him, I've spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I spoke nothing in secret. So why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. You see, they didn't. The, the issue wasn't just his teaching. It was his very presence. You know, he was out in the public square. Everyone knew what he taught what he stood for. He even spoke face to face with you. He says, I was with you. And you're doing this? But here they come in the dark of night, covering up their secret reason for not acting against him openly. So who really is the robber? Jesus was in the light, in the open, in sincerity of the truth, and they've got to do their dastardly deed in the dark. Their whole manner of arrest is ridiculous. So who is the wolves in sheep's clothing? And yet he confirmed yet again that this has to take place to fulfill the Scriptures. Their sinful deeds, getting him to the trumped-up charges of the mock trial and up to the cross, would serve God's redemptive plan. This is the resilient Resolution of our glorious Lord. His eye focused on the sovereign plan of God, not the wicked, malicious man. And all his pupils that he's been training for three years to carry out his ministry, they're ecstatic at this moment, right? They're supportive. They're right next to him, right? No. Yeah, this is the clinching point the cowardly apostles in verses 50 to 52. They all left him and fled. That word left is aphie me. You say, well, I don't know the Greek. What's that mean? Well, this is a term many times translated as forgive, pardon, or send away. It's got a range of meaning depending on the context. 
It even means divorce or send away or leave. That's its usage here. And this was high-handed, intentional forsaking. They did as Jesus had already told them that they were going to be scandalized. They're going to be brought up in the excitement and, and the fear of it all and be overcome by the drastic events that overtook them because they didn't watch and pray. So they fell and fled. Watch and pray, fall and flee. All their hopes crashed in this dark hour as their faith was demoralized. Yeah, they loved him. We're not going to question their motives. But they responded wrongly in that they fled. They just wanted to escape, disappear. And that little word, all, which in our English New American Standard is the third word of the text. In the underlying language, language, it's the first word, to emphasize. The complete forsakenness. So the last words that Mark gives in the sentence is this fleeing. These few words drive home, as it were, hammer blows. The failure of the disciples without exception. The complete forsakenness. They all drank the cup in the upper room. They all pledged to die with him on the way to Gethsemane. And here, at the end of the Gethsemane scene, they all deserted. Forsaken by his closest friends, let alone what would happen at the cross shortly when his father turned his face away. It closes with this most dramatic image of a young man. Mark's the only one that tells us about this guy. The other gospel writers don't. It reads kind of like a personal reminiscence. Probably this is the embarrassed confession of our author, John Mark. The only other streaker we find in Scripture is where? He's in the Old Testament, the young man Joseph, who fled from Potiphar's wife, leaving his garments in her hands lest he be accused of sexual impurity. For Joseph, it was a virtuous flight, but for Mark, it was a cowardly one. The only other young man Mark mentions besides right here is in chapter 16. You get into the tomb where this young man announces Jesus is risen. Only Mark describes the angel as a young man. An intentional, authorial connection. One young man runs away, our text today, leaving his garment and Jesus to his death. And yet another young man, wearing a white robe, declaring in the empty tomb, Jesus is alive. One New Testament scholar suggests that if the Passover was at Mark's mother's house, and if Judas is, it first takes the band of hundreds of people to the house, because that's where he left, he left Jesus and the rest of the disciples there still having supper together. Mark would have heard all the tumult and hurried to follow this motley crew. No time to get dressed, just a linen sheet over his body that was pulled free and he escaped naked. Either his sleeping garment or a sheet hastily wrapped around himself. So here we've got players of betrayal and arrest. A hostile crowd, deceitful traitor, impulsive disciple, the incomparable Christ ending with the cowardly apostles who all flee. It's a story of betrayal and arrest. In Saratoga, New York, there's a strange monument. It's comprised of a sculpture of a boot and an inscription of praise that never mentions the name of the one being memorialized. That monument is an honor of Benedict Arnold, a brave Revolutionary War general before he became a traitor. 
His actions helped avoid disaster at the Battle of Saratoga. When Arnold tried to sell out West Point Colonial Fort, he became a traitor. Later commanded a Red Coat Army against the colonists. Later went to England where a few praised him, but most did what to Benedict Arnold? They reviled him, just like Judas. He was given land in Canada, but that did not help him find any security or comfort in his later days because of his dastardly deed. Someone thought Arnold deserved some kind of recognition for his early bravery, but because he was anathema, his name never was mentioned on the inscription, his boot was memorialized because he had been wounded in the leg in the battle. That's the way it is for traitors. Whatever good they might have done is obscured by the act of betrayal. Judas learned and taught that lesson well, so that to even mention the name Judas is to think of one deed, betrayal. And what's different about these disciples, even though they all flee, you think they ever figure this all out? Take your Bibles and go over to First Peter with me. I think Peter finally got it because the message that he relayed was not only how Jesus dealt with such injustice and betrayal, but how we're to follow that same example in our injustices. First Peter 2. As Peter finally got it, here's how the Spirit moved him to pen. 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23. He says to the scattered saints, you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he offered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. You look at man on a horizontal plane, there's going to be betrayal, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be persecution. Jesus didn't look to mere man. He looked to his Father and trusted his soul to his Father. Notice the contrasting responses of Jesus and Peter back in our text of Mark 14. Peter cuts off an ear. Where's the trust in God? For what you can't see, living by faith, not by sight. Or boastfully proclaiming, I'll die for you, and he scampers away. Beloved, will you live faithfully in daily discipline of a life of righteousness? Mark, Mark's lack of identity invites us today to examine our own readiness to abandon Jesus. He epitomizes the save yourself if you can mentality that causes disciples to desert Jesus in a panic, unprepared for testing. So ready yourself, dear believer. Sadly, Amos' words of Amos 2.16 have come to pass with all Jesus' followers that day that says even the bravest among the warriors will flee naked in that day, declares the Lord. And though Amos was speaking of a different day, friends, may it not be our day. I pray with you. Father, thank you for the scriptures that we have the privilege to open, not only weekly together, but personally and daily and on our own. Continue to show us the preciousness of our incomparable Christ revealed in the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John grow our affections after him, grow our willing resolve in faithfulness, come hell or high water, that we do not deny you. Only you have the words of eternal life. We give you much praise in your son's name and for his sake. Amen.